covering this upcoming week. For more, go to our website, booktv.org, and visit upcoming programs. Up next on Book TV, Afterwards, with guest host Sally Quinn, founding editor of the Washington Post blog On Faith. This week, acclaimed religion author Karen Armstrong and her latest book, Fields of Blood. In it, she argues that the formation of every religion involved battles and bloodshed, resulting in a permanent bond between war and faith. This program is about an hour. Karen, hi. I'm so glad that you Hello, could Sally. join us this morning. Um, I have to say that I'm, I'm stunned that you managed to put out one of these books. It seems like every two years. I mean, this is one of the most extraordinary <laughs> scholarly feats I've ever seen. I, I, I don't know how you keep all this information in your head and how you, how you do this, um, but that's another story. <laughs> but I want to talk to you about your book because uh, it is, it's first of all, so definitive about violence and religion. But secondly, your thesis is really interesting, um, which is that religion may not necessarily be the cause of all violence. And I wondered what prompted you to do this book in the first place. Uh, just because, because I'm a writer about religion, uh, I keep getting told by taxi drivers, psychiatrists, and co uh, you know teachers. Uh, that religion's been the cause of all the major wars in history. And it really jars because it's clearly not true. The First World and Second World Wars were not caused for, by religion. They were fought for secular nationalism. Um, and um, I think that if we get, keep on just casting religion in the role of the absolute villain, we are uh, not looking at some of the other factors that uh, military historians tell us are always involved in both violence and terrorism. We never go to war, they tell us, for a single reason or for a single ideology. There are always other factors involved. Uh, one of the chief being uh, competition for scarce resources. The economic role has always been major. And these things blend together with ideology. Uh, you know, one, one of the things that, uh, sorry, one of the things that you talk about, you, you lay out a number of, of reasons why people go to war. Um, obviously, politics is one of the major reasons, economic resources. But uh, what, what fascinated me was when you talked about search for meaning, that people were looking for yes. search for meaning. And part of that is, um, the excitement, almost the ecstasy of going to war, um, youthful exuberance, um, uh, and, and the necessity. You talk about how without wars there would probably be no civilization. Um, and so all of those yes. reasons are interesting, but the one that got me most was the search for meaning. Yes, because we are meaning-seeking creatures. Uh, it's part of our human condition. Uh, dogs, as far as we know, don't spend a great deal of time agonizing about the canine condition or the plight of dogs in other parts of the world. But we do, and we fall very easily into despair if we can't find some kind of ultimate significance in our lives. And uh, warfare actually has been, for men particularly, one of the uh, one of the, the, the triggers for a certain ecstasy uh, that uh, Chris Hedges, New York Times correspondent, has written a very good book uh, called "War Is a Force That Gives Us Meaning." Um, everything becomes crystal clear for men on the battlefield. There's us and them. It's black and white, and also. Uh, that he says that when you're in the midst of conflict, you see how very, very trivial and pointless most of civilian life is. I was talking to a, um, a military historian in Britain just last month, and he was telling me that one of the chief causes that drives young people to go to the battlefield is boredom a sense of utter boredom and futility in their lives. Um, and, and, and they get it in the way that I don't think women do in the same way in, in warfare. You know, you, you just brought up a subject that um, you didn't really touch very much on in your book, which is what about women? Uh, you know, there's so much about mm. the alpha male and, you know, there's rape yes. and there's pillage and there's taking away the women and 
bringing them back and you know women were slaves women were chattel uh, man's search for meaning the ecstasy youthful exuberance but there's nothing about women where do women fit into all of this violence uh, uh, well not so much um, because the war has been very much a masculine ne a masculine game uh, we don't have the physical strength for it, for one thing, and also we're not programmed for it. For the vast part of our um, evolution, the longest period of, in, hum in human history was our period as hun of hunter-gatherers, when the men, in order to survive before the invention of agriculture, had to kill animals. And they became professional killers, using their big brains to invent a technology that enabled them to kill creatures far bigger than themselves. And the women stayed at home. Uh, now, women are beginning to come onto the scene now politically more than they ever did before. Um, and people have often said to me, well, now, as women don't have this urge for violence in the same way, perhaps they can bring something new to the scene. But, you know, whenever people say that to me, the shade of Mrs. Thatcher rises up before me. And who was, you can hardly, she, 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 she fought the, a pointless war in the Falklands. Um, and I think if women now have a contribution to make, it's the, I, what we should do is that we've all, all of us, however privileged we are, and I've been, had a certainly a very privileged life as, 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 as a woman, uh, we've all had experience of being ostracized and patronized and marginalized, pushed out of the way. And I think if we want to bring something new, we should bring that experience onto the table and uh, stand up, give voice to the plight of people all around the world who are also marginalized and oppressed in some way. Because so many of the problems that we're having today comes from the vast disparity in wealth and power in the world that's causing huge alienation, distress, anger and rage that explodes in the way we see every day on, on the news. Well, you know, what, what, I, what fascinates me is from the beginning of time, and you start out very early, even pre-religion in your book, uh, that women are sort of on the sidelines, uh, and, and yet they are the ones who suffer the most in war. If men are going out because they, they're they're looking for heroic deeds in battle or because they're young and or because they're bored or because they get a sense of ecstasy women don't get anything except they get killed and their children get killed and and their lives that, get disrupted mm -hmm. why haven't women put a stop to it over the years why have women sat on the sidelines i mean one thing about margaret thatcher is that she did order the war but she wasn't act that out there on the battlefield uh, no, in indeed, Sally. Uh, I think, too, it's not only women who, who've been these, the, the, the uh, casualties of war. I think we've got to remember that the, the warrior class, until the modern period, the warrior class rep was only an aristoc aristocratic class. The vast mass of the population were peasants who uh, were continually, during, as, as aristocrats fought one another, uh, killed, uh, their livestock destroyed, uh, their buildings burned, uh, they were starved to death, died of disease, women and the poor. And I think uh, it's the powerless people of this world, which the vast majority of the population, uh, who have been um, sufferers from war. Um, and that, that's, that's pr still pretty true today. When you start um, in your book um, and you write about the beginning of violence, um, you're, you're talking about uh, the fact that pre-religion, there really wasn't anything called religion, and that what, what took the place of what we now call religion was community and community rituals. And uh, that, that when people were battling, they weren't battling for religious reasons at all because there was no religion. Well, uh, our word religion um, is, is a new development in the West. Uh, pre before the modern period, before the 18th century, uh, nobody thought of religion in a separate category because it pervaded everything in life because it was what 
the, the, the rituals, uh, the, the prayers, the gods, the goddesses, the myths were all to give us that kind of meaning and significance to everything we did. But it blended uh, with all other activities. It was in the early modern period, in about the 18th century, that we in Europe and, and you in the, here in what would become the United States separated religion off from politics. Um, and saw it as, a, as a, a, an essentially private search, uh, something that was personal uh, for, to the individual that had nothing to do with public life. Now, this was an entirely new development. No other culture has anything like this concept of religion. The Oxford Classical Dictionary tells us that there's no word in Greek or Latin that corresponds to the word religious or religion in English. Uh, words that we translate as religion in other languages, like a din in Arabic or dharma in Sanskrit, invariably refer to something much larger and more encompassing. So that before the 18th century, it was impossible to say where uh, religion ended and politics began. There, there was no conceptual means of, uh, of, of separating the two. It was like it, to take religion, as it were, out of politics or warfare or state building was as, would be like trying to take the gin out of the cocktail. It, it so pervaded, so commingled with the two. And certainly, you're absolutely right, that community, uh, people didn't experience God much by themselves from the very beginning of, of human society. They experienced it together. Uh, and that's uh, the, 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 the notion of community uh, is, is, has been crucial in, the, in the, the whole history of religion. And it's by living with one another uh, in a kindly and compassionate way that puts the ego to the back, back burner uh, we get intimations of transcendence. And the religions have institutionalized this. First of all, the Buddha in his, um, in his uh, Sangha, his monastic order of monks. And the community life was an essential way to get to Nirvana. Now, the important thing about these communities was that they were always pretty political. They were always a kind of uh, speaking, altern eloquent alternative to the violence of aristocratic life in the court with its uh, concern about warfare and uh, egotism and gaining wealth and uh, plundering other people's fields and uh, taking off their way their peasants. Uh, all that was uh, a, 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 a lot of aggression in civilized life, therefore. Uh, whereas uh, it, it, in, in the Buddhist Sangha, similarly in the early Christian communities, certainly in the Jewish communities and the Muslim Ummah in Mecca, the community in Mecca set up by the Prophet, was meant to be a, both an alternative and a rebuke to the way uh, the aristocratic court, where, which was the war, warmonger, was conducting itself. One of the things that fascinates me is that you talk about how um that warfare and violence was really necessary um, for civilization and that without that there would not have been any civilization. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, this is what one made me want to write this book actually. Um, I came across this extraordinary fact that in every single civilization before the modern period, before we in invented industrialized society, every single civilization depended on agriculture. And that meant that uh, a small, in every single civilization, whether it's in China, India, Europe, the Middle East, um, developed a, a, an iniquitous system whereby a small aristocracy comprising at most 5% of the population took away the surplus of, the, of produce grown by the peasants and kept them at subsistence level in poverty and degradation and used this wealth that they'd taken uh, to, uh, to fund their uh, civilizational projects. This was, could only have been done by force. Um, they had the peasants somehow had to be subdued, and uh, so ninety percent of the population throughout his for five thousand years were kept in penury, uh, distress, and anger. Now, um, th so f f with and, and historians tell us that without this terrible system, 
we would probably not have developed beyond a primitive level as a species because this system uh, supported a privileged caste with the people who had the leisure to ex explore the arts and sciences on which civilization depended. Plus, when your uh, economy is based on agriculture, the only way you can, if you like, increase your gross national product is by acquiring more arable land and more peasants to farm it. Consequently, uh, the, uh, warfare became essential to the economy. It was the only way for the economy to grow. And plunder, too, was also essential to supporting the aristocratic lifestyle. It, the economic aspect was always there. But, of course, uh, because we're meaning-seeking creatures, uh, this, uh, this effort, this uh, struggle to achieve civilization was mythologized in, in, the var in various religious systems to give it meaning, to give it significance. But at the same time, there were always prophets and sages. I'm thinking of the prophets of Israel, for example, Jesus, Muhammad, uh, Confucius, uh, who spoke out against this system of the oppression and, and, and castigated people, uh, rulers for oppressing the poor in this way, and had harsh words for those uh, people who said their prayers punctiliously or, or worshipped in the temple but neglected the plight of the poor and the oppressed. Well, are, are, are uh, you so, saying... Yeah. No, I was going to say, so are you saying that violence was a good thing or is a good thing or can no. be a good thing or war? I mean, no, because always... without it, we wouldn't have civilization. It's kind of a conundrum. Absolutely. The civilization is a dilemma for us all. Um, of course, I don't think violence and warfare is a good thing. It's appalling, just as that system of agrarian oppression was utterly appalling. Uh, but, but, it, but it's a dilemma. Um, and uh, the American Trappist monk Thomas Merton says that all those of us who benefit from a system of oppression are in some way implicated in the suffering that it, it's cause, it has been caused. And all of us alive today owe our civilizational achievements and our privileged lifestyles to, the, to all those millions of men and women who were oppressed for 5,000 years in this way, the, 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 the mass of society. And I wanted to call my book originally um, Ashoka's Dilemma, but I knew my publishers wouldn't allow me to have that because <laughs> no one would ever hear about Ashoka. But um, Ashoka was a third century emperor in, um, in India, the first emperor to rule the whole of India. And he uh, was a cruel man. He'd come to the throne after killing two of his brothers, as was quite common in India at that time. Uh, but eight years into his reign, he accompanied the army on, a, on, a, war, on a, a campaign to put down a rebellion in a city, Kalinga. And he was horrified at the bloodshed, the mass of dead, horrified to see the thousands, 140,000 uh, prisoners of war torn from their families and taken off for forced agricultural labor in other parts of the empire. And he put up throughout India these extraordinary inscriptions written on vast rock faces and huge cylindrical pillars uh, all over his domains throughout India. They were uncovered and translated in the 19th century, in which he says how dis distressed he was at the violence, how he himself is going to give up violence and uh, 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 not, no more warfare, no more hunting even. Uh, he's going to go on pilgrimages, royal pilgrimages to Buddhist shrines instead. He's saying that uh, we must listen calmly to all teachers. If we have to walk, if we have to go to war, uh, we must keep punishment to the lowest level possible. Uh, then that, uh, but for all this, and he's, he's calling for a more compassionate society. And, in, and finally, he would become a lay Buddhist. But for all this, he could never disband his army because he knew that had he done so, all the wannabe emperors 
would start fighting one another to succeed him, and the people who would suffer most would be the mass of the poor whom he was about whom he was so concerned and so distressed. Nor could he repatriate all those prisoners of war who had been carted off for forced labour uh, in uh, other parts of the empire because they were essential to the agrarian economy. Without this kind of forced labour, the the economy goes down the chute. So this is the dial and his and his. Um, dilemma, Ashoka, is the dilemma of civilization itself, that it depends on great inequity. And you can say much the same is pretty well true today, because you and I, Sally, in our countries, live lives of incredible privilege. Um, but there's a huge inequity of uh, resources, wealth, and power in the world. Um, and uh, it's time, we ha I think we have to uh, make ourselves aware of this because it, if we don't now learn to implement the golden rule globally, the golden rule which has been uh, articulated in every single major uh, tradition, never treat others as you would not like to be treated yourself. Unless we do this uh, globally now and make sure that all peoples, whoever they are, are treated with uh, the kind of respect we wish for ourselves, uh, we're not going to have a viable world. If the British had applied the golden rule in their colonies to their subject peoples in their empires, I don't think we'd be having so many political problems today. You know, you, you, you mentioned Ashoka, I was going to bring that up, and Confucius, who basically was the one who first wrote about the golden rule, <clears throat> and the Buddha and Jesus. Where did their sense of morality, if that's what it is, where did that come from? Because if it was in fact convenient and if it was economically prosperous to continue on with war, then how did they happen to come, come upon this view that, uh, that hurting other people was not a good thing? You know, I, I think we have inherited this stubborn sense that life, people should live in equality with one another from the hunter-gatherers, uh, from the time before civilization, the longest part of our history, uh, 20,000 years or more. Um, and, uh, and this has, because uh, hunter-gatherer societies, every, they are, we can tell from modern hunter-gatherer societies, are essentially egalitarian. They have to be, because there isn't enough, they're not, there's no surplus of wealth. They think wealth has to be shared or the tribe doesn't survive. And they cut, they, they, everybody has the same fighting skills, so it's, it's almost impossible for one leader to emerge and suppress the others. And they're small communities. But it is ingrained in all of us uh, that uh, unfairness is wrong. One of the earliest things that most children say is, it's not fair, a sense of outrage there. And so I, I think that con people like Confucius and Jesus and the Buddha and the prophets of Israel and the rabbis and uh, the prophet Muhammad, they were all articulating this ingrained sense uh, that even though none of us ha have ever had an experience of an entirely just society, that things ought to be like that. And they've, they have kept that voice alive, even at a time when there was no hope uh, of, of articulating it politically in, in the dilemma of civilization. Karen, you write about the Crusades and the Inquisition, and mm. I think if if um, I think what most people, when they talk about religion being the cause of violence, would bring up the Crusades and bring up the Inquisition as two totally religious-inspired mm. actions. Uh, and yet you say that's not necessarily true. Can you explain that? No. Yes, yeah, sure. I, I, uh, because, um, as I say, we go to war for many, many interrelated reasons. We never do anything purely for God. Uh, believe me, I know, because I tried as a nun for seven years to do, to, to do every action entirely for God, and it's impossible because our motivation is always so entirely mixed. Now, the Crusades were certainly imbued, like all human activities were, with uh, religious passion. 
Uh, but uh, the Pope was also very politically motivated. He wanted to use the, uh, the, the Knights of Europe to extend his power into the East, uh, especially as he was responding to a plea for help from the Eastern Emperor of, of the, uh, in the Greek Orthodox world, uh, who did not accept the supremacy of the Pope. And the crusade would be a riposte to that. He was also engaged in a long struggle fought in Europe between the Pope, the Church, and the, uh, the, the kings of Europe as to who was going to be top dog, who was going to be the real leader. Um, and he was asserting his uh, he was he was asserting his right, as opposed to the king, to mobilise the whole of Europe for warfare. It was a very astute political um, motion. By the end of the Crusades, actually, it was more important. Um, uh, the, what was more important was less what happened in the Middle East or how the fighting was going on there than uh, what ha the impact the Crusade had politically at home and how it enhanced a crusader crusaders uh, ambition so the two religion and politics were infused in a sort of co cocktail here and similarly uh, the, with the inquisition um, it was an, an appallingly flawed solution to a difficult uh, problem that Ferdinand and Isabella the Catholic monarchs of Spain had uh, when they came to the throne after the country, uh, the whole Pen Iberian Peninsula, had been torn apart in a bitter civil war. And they were facing, too, the, the huge danger, imminent danger, of the, an attack by the Ottomans. And they had, in Spain, a a, still a Muslim princi principality in Granada. They, they were on the front line of what Europe felt was a war with against the Islamic world. And very often, when people are a people is threatened uh, from by an outside enemy. We see this again and again in, in the book, in my story. They turn on an enemy within. Um, a sort of see, they, they have terrified fantasies of a sort of fifth column of people. And the people they picked on, uh, the, peop the common people were picking on as the uh, sort of the fifth column, were the, 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 the Jews who'd converted to Christianity. Um, a lot of them had converted to Christianity. They were called the conversos. They were, uh, ec became extremely successful in the Christian world, and they were resented for it. Um, they weren't against Jews, practicing Jews at this time, but rather the conversos, and they started the Inquisition against them. Uh, but it was, a, it was a tragedy because for centuries, uh, under Muslim rule, uh, Jews, Christians and Muslims had lived together in relative harmony in the Iberian Peninsula. But uh, the, uh, the, the, the monarchs had introduced the, uh, the, the uh, hatred and suspicion of the enemy uh, into, uh, the, into Spain for the first time. It was, fewer people died in the Inquisition than is commonly thought. Um, and it was, uh, and the Inquisition was quite rightly hated, but it was also resented in the rest of Europe because Spain was definitely the most powerful uh, kingdom in Europe at that time. And so the, the stories of the Inquisition have got overblown, especially in the Protestant world. But, uh, but still, it was an appalling incident. But in, again, a, an infusion of both politics and, and religious passions in that kind of cocktail. You mentioned uh, in, in your book, In the Crusades, that um, a lot of these young men who went off to the Crusades had no idea what they were doing or where they were going, and, and that they would stop at Jewish communities and say, but wait a minute, why are we going off to the Middle East to kill Muslims when the Jews killed Christ? Why don't we just do it here and not have to travel all that distance? And I, I thought that was, uh, it had never occurred to me, I didn't know that was part of the Crusades. It was, the, the people were genuinely bewildered. You can imagine, now when a ruler is going to, wants to go war, he goes on TV and everybody explain, knows what's happening. But everybody was, young people were, and aristocrats were signing up for the Crusades because it was an adventure in the way that we've talked about. Uh, and it was imbued with religion because we're going to liberate the tomb of Christ from the Saracens. But um, a lot of them were really confused. 
they had this false idea that the Jews had killed Jesus. Uh, in fact, of course, we know it was the Romans who put Jesus to death uh, rather than, than, than the Jewish people, and Jesus was himself Jewish. But, uh, the, um, but they, they were puzzled, both in, in G the German crusaders and the French crusaders that were saying, look, we've got it all backward. Uh, we, they, at this point, uh, Europeans knew next to nothing about Islam. They, the, the Muslims were a shadowy presence on, 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 on the horizons. Why were they flogging 3,000 miles to the Middle East through incredible dangers when the Jews were alive and well on their very doorsteps? Um, but here again, too, there were economic reasons. Uh, for this sudden hatred of Jews who'd hitherto been well integrated into European society because Europe was beginning its slow progress to creating a commercial empire, uh, a commercial economy that would eventually in the 19th century replace the agrarian empire. Um, but in any uh, period of massive social change uh, there's, there's, it, this puts a great strain on social relations. We see it in mo countries modernizing today, uh, the, the, uh, put, uh, going through this painful rite of passage from a pre-modern to a modern state of affairs, uh, how this, uh, this, this creates social tension. And the Jews were very much associated with money, and with the with the with the with the commerce that was resented so much uh, by the by the people who weren't benefiting from it. So um, again, a um, whole amalgam, but it's a tragic event because every time in the future a crusade was called to kill Muslims in the in the East, uh, those who didn't go on crusade would kill Jews at home, and it made anti-Semitism a chronic disease in Europe. And Jews and Muslims became somehow linked in the European mind as bogies in some way. You, uh, you talked about religion earlier and the, the meaning of religion, how the, the word really didn't exist uh, until, I guess, Martin Luther is the first person who was sort of pro a proponent of the separation of church and state but also that religion became something that was internal instead of external. And until that time, uh, religion had been about the community, about the state, uh, and now it suddenly became something that was within us. How did that happen, and what did that mean in terms of religion and violence? Well, uh, Martin Luther's an interesting uh, figure. Uh, he is the first European to, to advocate the separation of church and state. Uh, he also showed uh, that this would not necessarily be an ironic or peaceful uh, alternative uh, because uh, in when he, he uh, his idea was that the world was so corrupt uh, that religion should have nothing to do with it. It should really basically literally let the world and its problems go to hell while you, the, the, the religions, religious retreated into the, the inner kingdom of God within them. Uh, but also during the Peasants' War, uh, uh, where there was a Peasants' Revolt in Germany at this time, another symptom of the modernization process that was going on, uh, he, uh, he told the princes to go in and kill them kill the peasants, to smite them, burn them, put them down as you would put down a mad dog, he said, because they had committed, the peasants had committed the cardinal sin of mixing up religion and politics. They were quoting the gospel to, sh to say that, look, this huge inequity was against the teachings of Christ, who taught that all people were equal and should love one another and, and, the, po and, and the rich and poor should sit at the same table. Um, and, and even though this is quite right from the gospel and Martin Luther was, ke was keen on uh, going back to the scripture, uh, it cut no ice with him. As far as him, peasants should be slaughtered and killed. Protestant Christianity is the only form of uh, religion uh, that, uh, that suits our modern conception of religion as an essentially private quest. But Luther's uh, aggression shows that there's also been an aggression in secularism too. Um, and we see that particularly uh, in the revolutionary France, for example, when 
uh, the, uh, the, the French, during their revolution, separate, wanted to get rid of the Catholic Church, which uh, was so I intimately entwined with the old aristocratic order that they were t pulling down. Uh, they, the one of the first acts of the new National Assembly was to confiscate all church property and put it over at the to the, the state and to abolish the religious orders. Uh, they followed that up a year later with the September massacres when the uh, mobs were let loose on the prisons where a lot of priests were incarcerated and slaughtered them all in, two, in a couple of nights. Uh, thousands of people were killed. Um, and then they, uh, in the same, later that year, the revolutionary armies killed probably about a quarter of a thousand people in the Vendée in western France who were protesting against the, an the uh, anti-Catholic uh, measures of the regime. So secularism has often been imposed violently and that's been particularly true in the Middle East and many of the, uh, many of the uh, problems we're having today had springs from um, a a too violent, too hasty secularization of a country uh, which has been done uh, cruelly uh, with bloods, uh, blood and slaughter and has pushed um, the r Islam into a more aggressive mode. You, um, you have a chapter called Holy Terror and I'd like to talk about terrorism now. Um, you, you quote uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, the the famous atheist is saying that uh, only the only religious faith uh, could motivate such madness as terrorism. Um, but I would like to hear your definition of terrorism because I think it's different from what most people think. Well, uh, terrorism, like religion, is a word that is notoriously dif difficult to define. So much so that it's. Um, that, that those scholars who specialize in the study of terrorism say that it, it's, it's hopelessly lost in semantic confusion. Uh, you could say that it involves the killing of innocent people by a group. Um, but um, it's, so, does, so does ordinary warfare. And that's certainly true. The state has been by far the biggest killer of civilians, uh, far more than any any uh, individual group of terrorists. Uh, the in w w and, th and that has been exponentially increasing in the last century. In World War I, only 5% of the people who died were uh, civilians. Um, th in, six, in, in the Second World War, that f those figures shot up to 66.5% of the casualties of World War II were civilians. They were deliberately targeted by a allied scientists who created special bombs that would create, have an effect that would drop, uh, a disastrous effect that were dropped on German and uh, Japanese cities precisely to terrorize the population and dropped uh, on uh, residential areas of civilians. Now it's 90% of, of, of people uh, who are, are dying in our current wars have been civilians. So uh, you can't say it's just terrorism is just about the killing of civilians, therefore. Um, and uh, they also s insist that whatever reasons people give for terrorist action, um, that, you know, whether it's all done for Allah or it's for God or. Uh, that it is always an inescapably political. It is, that's the one thing you can say about terrorism, is it always has a political focus. It's about power, about grabbing power, or uh, getting rid of a, of, of a, of a certain power structure, uh, or tearing down um, a certain, certain element in society. It's about, it's about power. So, and that was certainly true if you look at Al-Qaeda. Um, Certainly, there's all this talk about God, uh, uh, but uh, the, um, there's also, uh, in, in bin Laden's speeches, uh, a strong political mo uh, anger with Saudi, the Sa Saudi Arabia um, and Western policy, and strong anger about Western policy in the Middle East. Um, so, the, again, that you have this mingling of, of, of motivation. So, everyone who is anti Islam or anti-Muslim says that Islam is a uh, 
violent religion. And, um, and yet most Muslims will say that it is not a violent religion, and in fact terrorism is against the Quran and against everything that Islam stands for. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me what you think about Islam and uh, about the Muslim religion and, and whether you believe it's a peaceful religion or violent, and why is it that they are always associated in, in people's minds with terrorism? Well, um, first of all, uh, Islam is, ha has been for centuries until the modern period a far more tolerant religion uh, than, um, th than, say, Christianity. Um, th that, and the, the word jihad, which we, you know, has now entered the English le lexicon, uh, is, seen, is often thought to be central to the Quran. Um, in fact, it isn't. Uh, it's the, the word jihad and its derivatives occur only 41 times in the Quran, and in uh, only 10 of those instances does it uh, refer unambiguously to warfare. The, the word jihad means struggle, um, and it's a struggle sometimes that you have to fight when uh, the little Muslim community was uh, being threatened with extermination by the Meccan establishment. Uh, but uh, also it's a, a jihad, a struggle, to share your food uh, with somebody who is worse off than yourself uh, when, when you've hardly got any uh, resources yourself. That's also a struggle. It's also jihad. There's a very famous... Uh, Hadith, uh, a, a, a saying uh, that uh, attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, uh, when he's returning from a battle, he says to his companions, "We're returning from the lesser jihad, that is the battle, and going back to the uh, greater jihad, that is the uh, far more difficult and yet much more important struggle of reforming your own society and your own heart." Um, and that has been uh, Muslim policy throughout the ages. Uh, the um, the, the uh, Muslim law uh, was devised uh, at, at a time when Muslims uh, ran the biggest empire the world had ever seen. Um, and it is about, the Muslim law speaks only about defensive warfare, not aggressive warfare. By this time, expansion had stopped. They knew the Muslims, the Abbasids, knew that they could not expand the empire any further. It reached its limits. But they had to defend their frontier. So it's very much a defensive warfare, not an aggressive warfare that is being um, uh, advocated. And yes, there are some passages in the Quran that speak of warfare and, 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 and killing. These are passages that came to the Prophet at a time when they were actually fighting battles. And there have been various, I, uh, and I discuss them all in the book in detail, various exegetical strategies to balance all the, the, those, those few passages with the much larger um, number of uh, Quranic passages that speak of the importance of reconciliation. And even these um, e extremely aggressive passages nearly always, in fact always, segue from kill them to, but, if, but it's better for your souls to sit down and discuss this peacefully. And, it, and, and reconciliation is better and, go and God is always forgiving. There's, that balance is always there. Now, um, until recently, uh, nobody read the Quran on its own. Just as Jews don't read uh, the J Jewish scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, without uh, the ta Talmudic exegesis. Uh, you see the Jewish, Jewish scriptures through the lens of the, of the rabbinical exegesis, uh, that had been de developed over centuries, which was very much concerned to mitigate the extremely violent passages in the Hebrew Bible. Um, uh, we've all got violent passages in our scriptures because we are violent people and, and, they, and our scriptures reflect us. But in the Muslim world too, uh, nobody just picked up the Quran and picked out a few passages from jihad and ignored the rest. 
uh, uh, this this caution of reading the scripture in the light of all this traditional exegesis actually held extremist um, uh, opinions at bay. Now, uh, why is there so much terrorism in the Muslim world now? Because, uh, I, I said earlier, Muslims have had a much more difficult passage to modernity than we have. Uh, number one, they were a great world power. And they were, when the uh, British and the, the French came in and subdued them uh, in their empires, uh, they were reduced overnight to a dependent bloc. And that humiliation uh, goes very deep. And uh, humiliation is often a huge cause of violence, not just in Islam, but in other, other parts of the world. A sense of corro corrosive shame and humiliation, uh, that's a very dangerous thing to have loose in society. Secondly, as I said earlier, secularism has been imposed so violently that it's uh, acquired a nimbus of evil. And every fundamentalist movement that I have studied is rooted in a fear of annihilation. And uh, in the Muslim world, you can see why that uh, fear of annihilation is acute. And when you, uh, the Shahs used to make their soldiers go out with their bayonets, ripping off the women's veils and tearing them to pieces in front of them. In 1935, Shah Reza Pahlavi gave his soldiers orders to shoot at hundreds of unarmed, uh, unarmed demonstrators in one of the holiest shrines of Iran. And hundreds of Iranians were killed that day. Sunni fundamentalism developed in the ghastly concentration camps into which um, m m members of the Muslim Brotherhood were uh, incarcerated for 15 years without trial. Um, and do, often doing nothing more incriminating than, handi uh, than handing out a few leaflets. Um, and so in, thi in this embattled sense, you have a more extreme form of Islam developing. And that tragically has, uh, has, has erupted, as we've seen, in, in terrorist action. But it's not just purely Islam. Um, and. Uh, Let's look at suicide bombing, um, which we, we, it seems the quintessential uh, terrorist activity. Um, it, suicide bombing was not invented by Muslims. It was invented by the Tamil Tigers, who had no time for religion, who were utterly aggressive, uh, and who, uh, until, the, um, until the Iraq war, held the undisputed record of uh, suicide bombing. Robert Pape of the University of Chicago has done um, a survey of, excuse me, of every single suicide bombing that has occurred between um, 1980 and 2004. <coughs> and it concludes that it has nothing to do with either Islamic fundamentalism or indeed, and I quote, any kind of religion for that matter. Um, it's um, in, in Lebanon uh, in the 1980s, there were something like 30 odd suicide bombing attacks. Seven of them only were committed by Muslims, three by Christians, and the rest from se by secularists and socialists coming in from Syria. Um, and the, the main motive power, Robert Pape says, for a suicide action is when your homeland uh, the country you perceive as your homeland has been invaded or occupied by a superior military power or empire. In Lebanon, it was the United States and Israel too. And that has also, also inspired a suicide bombing for a while in Hamas. But again, if you look at the Hamas videos, uh, the, the young uh, martyrs-to-be uh, segue in, in the cocktail that we've seen throughout from an, uh, a, a, a prayer to say that they're going to meet Allah, the Lord of the worlds, into a national, nas pure secular, secularist nationalist ideal for liberation, the liberation of Palestine, then into a third world ideology, claiming that they're going to be a beacon of hope for all the oppressed people at, who are suffering under Western imperialism, and then back to uh, the liberation of Palestine, back to Islam. Again, that cocktail. What about uh, one I, of the chief? No, <laughs> no I was going to ask ISIS. you about ISIS. Yeah. I'd
Let's talk about yes. ISIS uh, because. Um, what, what, a, what do you think motivates them? I mean, they, they talk about this being a religious jihad, uh, and, you know, and, and the, the methods they use seem to go back to 2,000 or 3,000 years ago in terms of violence. What, what are they about? Well, um, ISIS uh, is, again, a pretty motley group. Uh, you've got some die-hard jihadis, and they come, they, they, their roots are in a particularly violent form of Saudi Arabian Wahhabism. Um, the Ikhwan, the brothers uh, who were Bedouin uh, tribes, who uh, were sort of civilized, made to leave nomadic life, uh, were, were t taught uh, uh, the very narrow form of Islam current in Saudi Arabia, known as Wahhabism, and they took it to an extreme, and they and they would they, they uh, had to be suppressed eventually by the Saudi monarch. But they, that kind of feeling and love of warfare they, uh, was 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 uh, was apparent, and that that's the core of of, of ISIS. But uh, then these h hordes, these hideous hordes that are overrunning Iraq and Syria at the moment, are not entirely composed of diehard uh, jihadis. Uh, a whole lot of thugs have also joined in the fray, uh, and who, who, uh, uh, who just love, you know, violence and love the excitement of it. Uh, plus, and significantly, a lot of malcontents left over from the Saddam regime. Uh, members of Saddam's disbanded army, for example, which the which the Americans, unwisely in my view, disbanded when they arrived in um, in, in, in Iraq, um, and the also Baathists, uh, the Socialist Party, also who hate the status quo set up after the Iraq War, and are, will bring and are happy to join in this 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 frenzy. Plus, many of the young people who are joining up. Um, are joining up for that same age-old uh, desire for meaning and glory, um, that uh, and and for many of them, Islamic uh, commitment is minimal. Two young jihadi would-be jihadis who left uh, Britain in May to go to Syria ordered two books from Amazon. Uh, one was Islam for Dummies. The other was the Quran for dummies, which shows the level of uh, knowledge of, 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 of the Quran, etc., that, that they had. Now, we've seen that terrorists, um, people, uh, t forensic psychiatrists, have made uh, extensive studies of, of terrorists who took part in the 9 11 atrocity and also those who, um, who uh, were picked up afterwards, like the shoe bomber Richard Reed or the Bo Boston Marathon uh, bombers, and found that in every case, it, only 20% of these people had a conventional Muslim upbringing. The vast majority of them were either, uh, either converts, like the uh, Canadian gunner a week or two ago, or they were, um, uh, they, 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 they were non-observant, like the Boston Marathon bombers, or they, were self, they are self-taught with a very smattering view of Islam derived from such tomes as Iran, uh, Islam for Dummies. Now, where do they come from? Uh, in some ways, I know exactly how they give the impression of going back, as you said, to two, two or 3,000 years uh, with their hideous beheadings. But these are all very strategically focused. This is in essentially also a modern movement. It expresses the dark side of modernity in which mass killing has been, a, sadly, a feature ever since the French Rev Revolution. It, during the French Revolution, in one year, 17,000 men, women and children were guillotined publicly by the revolutionary regime. Um, uh, the Young Turks in, in Turkey during World War I uh, a, a defiantly secularist, indeed atheistic movement, um, massacred um, a million uh, Armenians and to create a Turkic society. Um, and so, and, and we, I, I needn't detail the mass killings that preceded, that, that followed this throughout uh, the terrible 20th century in many ways. Furthermore, uh, the, 
they are also expressing um, a, in a very eccentric and bizarre way, a, a, an unease with the nation state, which served us well during our industrialization period in mobilizing the country for warfare. But it also, um, it's not so good now that our society is becoming more global. Whether we like it or not, uh, we are inextricably combined with one another. Uh, economically, when one market goes down, uh, the other markets um, th throughout the world plummet that day. Uh, what happens in the Middle East will have a blowback in Canada, almost, or, 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 the, or the West. We, are, we cannot live without one another, and yet our net nationalistic ideologies encourage us to focus too narrowly on the nation. And that's particularly true in the Middle East, where the nation states set up by the British and the French about 100 years ago were a arbitrary, uh, bizarre, uh, and uh, put together a whole lot of compa incompatible peoples uh, with, uh, um, and told them, tell them to create a nation. Very, very difficult to do. Almost set up to fail. And so, um, the, 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 uh, and also they're, very, they're modern too in their very successful economic handling of all the loot and oil that they've been acquiring on their travels. They're a, they're a very a successful corporation here in the modern sense. So in some, to see them as going back to the Dark Ages is unfortunately uh, not quite true. They, they are a bizarre and terrible group, uh, but they express a darker side of modernity that we don't often consider. Karen, we only have a few minutes left, but um, I wanted to ask you, because I was talking about going back to the darker side, uh, so where does all this lead us? Um, we, you know, we're in this violent world. Um, you talk about the fact that we are, in fact, a violent people. Violence is in our human nature. Um, and and are, are we going back to pre-religious days where it's really about the community? Are we going forward uh, with more uh, religious uh, involvement? Where, where does this all end? I, w I wish I knew. I, um, I got into this, uh, this, this kind of study not because I'm filled with peace and love and joy and religious uh, exaltation. I'm filled with dread as I look at where we're going. Um, I, I, um, I, there's a, a, even in our so-called tolerant uh, Western world, there's a lot of bigotry that reminds me forcibly of the bigotry that existed in Europe in the 1930s and 1940s that ended in the concentration camps. And in the, and, and the last decade of the last century, we saw more concentration camps on the boundaries of Europe, this time with Muslims in them. Um, and I, I fear terribly that we're not going back to community. Uh, we are locked into our cell phones and our computers and our personal Facebook, uh, we're, uh, we're almost retreating from community into a sort of virtual age. Um, and um, we're, I think what we need, if we don't want to do religion anymore, what we need is to cultivate, perhaps in secular ways, what the religions did as well as promote warfare and violence. That is, tell us to love our enemies, to love the stranger, if a stranger lives within your land, says Leviticus, do not molest him. You must treat him as one of your own people and love him as yourself, for you were strangers in Egypt. Uh, we've got to learn to reach out to the foreigner. Uh, we're, in, in Britain, we're not dealing with that at all. We can't, we, we've started to demonize the European Union. Our whole political converse now is about immigration, keeping them out. Uh, we don't want strangers living in our land. And, but we are living side by side with strangers and somehow, unless we manage to uh, create a, a more inclusive ideology uh, that we reach out as, as, as the religions taught us to include all creatures, not just to have concern for everybody, not just our own congenial group, I doubt that we're having, we'll have a viable world to hand on to the next generation. Karen Armstrong, thank you so much. Uh, your book.
um, Fields of Blood is an absolutely riveting book. I, I honestly couldn't put it down. It's got so much history, and also it's just a great story. So thank you for coming on. Thank you, Sally. Thank you very much. That was Afterwards, Book TV's signature program in which authors of the latest nonfiction books are interviewed by journalists, public policymakers, and others familiar with their material. Afterwards airs every weekend on Book TV at 10 p.m. on